There wasn't like a sex in the air. All of a sudden you start talking about whipped cream for hours. <laughs> the superficial crowd of which I am the king just have an incredible ability to just return to abnormal. It was a floating opium den called Nickel Bag. We had done a lot of coke that night and there was David Bowie against the wall. And so we started walking over there, tapped David on the shoulder and David turned around and went, Oh my God, get close to me! You and I sat next to Bianca at a dinner party for three hours talking about her garden in Nicaragua. Can you imagine how bored she was? <laughs> <laughs> this little kid came up to us with a mohawk and rubber waders and mylar streamers, and he said, my name's RuPaul, and I'm gonna be a big star. And I said, do you have drink tickets, darling? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has an Andy Warhol story. He did have a big penis and he did have sex. Everybody has, a, you know, a, a Madonna story. We were equal build in the advertising. Madonna, the must. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a bitch. <laughs> I'm James St. James. This is the trailer for the World of Wonder podcast, Night Fever, Nightlife Legends of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. I am joined by my co-hosts, the co-founders of World of Wonder, Fenton Bailey and Randy Barbado. Hello, boys. Hi. Hi there. How are you? Good. Good. Are you excited about this upcoming podcast that we're doing? Yes. And we're here to tell everybody what it's about, right? Yes. Why don't you give us in a nutshell what it is we can expect from uh, Night Fever? I think in a nutshell, the idea was that, you know, uh, people seem to be more and more interested in club culture and what went on in New York in the 80s when we were little Pop-Tarts running around and you were a little club kid with your lunchbox. And it's so let me on, damn it. Oh, sorry, excuse <laughs> me. Celebutant. Yes, there were all these tribes. And it seems to me that, that that history, if it doesn't get told, it's going to get forgotten. And, you know, we've made the movie Party Monster. We've made the documentary Party Monster. And it just seems that with you, James, you are a repository, which doesn't sound quite right, but you are a vessel. I am a receptacle. <laughs> <laughs> of the history of so many clubs and what went on in New York. And we just thought it'd be really interesting to do a podcast series that talks with those prime movers of that scene, right? We start with forever queen of the night, Diane Brill. We have the amazing nightlife writer, columnist, gossip columnist, uh, Michael Musto, journalist and reporter of all things New York nightlife. We have the fabulous Lisa Edelstein, who was my longtime cohort in the club scene, and she has now gone on to be a very famous actress in House and uh, Kaminsky Method and Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce and every sitcom ever. It's very exciting talking to her. Oh, my God. We have Peter Gation, who... Um... He really was, he ran limelight. He sort of- A mysterious presence on the scene. And he had this almost ominous presence, but the reality is he is just so sweet and amazing and super smart. He really built this whole career out of understanding what it takes to get people in a nightclub. And I think at one point, I don't forget how many nightclubs he owned, but he owned Limelight, Palladium, Tunnel. USA. USA. It was almost a monopoly of nightlife. And then, of course, was undone by Rudolph Giuliani and the Clean Up New York campaign. And it's, it's a terrible story. We have Walt Paper, club kid icon and a recent author of the book, New York Club Kids. It's a fascinating talk with him. He has a very interesting perspective on the 90s club scene. We have Moby. Responsible for so many iconic Clubland tunes of the 1990s. We have Ernie Glam, who is an amazing, iconic club kid. And also uh, especially famous for being Clara the Carefree Chicken uh, in the Disco 2000 days. And he was also a close friend of Michael Alix and really looked after him after his release from jail. We also have Rudolph, who is one of the great personalities of the New York club scene. He uh, has been involved in, he says, over 115 clubs, I believe, in his lifetime. Uh, most famously, Danceteria, Palladium, Quick, uh, uh, just a, a, a really somebody who has cultivated the scene and uh, just loved being a part of it. And he's just fascinating to go listen to. 
We have the amazing dancer Luis Extravaganza, who was in Truth or Dare and is a ballroom icon. Oh, we have Joey Arias. Oh my God, Joey Arias is the most amazing voice and is a queen on the scene. He was backup singer with David Bowie, Boys Keep Swinging on Saturday Night Live, but he has been on the scene downtown in New York forever. One of the things that I keep noticing as we've done this show is, first of all, how big the scene was, how how massive it was, and how many different scenes were going on simultaneously at the same time. But the more you talk to everybody, the more you see that there was an interconnectivity, that, that everybody, that the same names are woven through each narrative. And you hear the same, you hear different takes on the same stories. It's very gossipy. It's very name droppy. And I can hear Truman Capote cackling from the afterlife, uh, listening to it. Um, but I, I think that there's, we get to some real interesting truths and some real interesting stories. Randy, what, what was your take on all of it? It's really fascinating to reconnect with people who we knew um, either, you know, some people we, we knew quite well and others we knew um, socially, not as well, but have always had kind of warm feelings about. And it's, it's great um, with a few decades having with a few, with like four decades, three decades having passed, just to reconnect with these people. You know, one of the interesting revelations for me is how warm and fuzzy and friendly so many of the people who were involved in the club scene are today. I never really, like back then, they just seemed fa fabulous and they seemed- Unapproachable. Unapproachable. And yet, really, all of them and so many of us are just a bunch of outsiders who felt like we didn't have a place, um, we didn't belong anywhere, and we all migrated to New York City and became found our tribe and hung out. And here we are, old, you know, old men. Come <laughs> um, Reconnecting, and it's nice. And everybody has been eager to share, share their story and eager to reconnect. And every, like you said, every, these people who were sort of intimidating a little bit, um, you know, like Peter Gation, who was just a teddy bear. He's just was the sweetest, kindest guy. Rudolph, who was always, you know, sort of a little above all of us, is just, a, it, it's like old friends. It was just reconnecting with old friends. So much of what so many of these people were doing back then is admirable. And so it is great that we're doing this because I think in the world we lived in then, it was difficult to kind of um, survive in the nightclub scene and make a name for yourself. And people were making art and people were making music. And there was like a, a passion um, to what people were doing. I think that's really interesting. I just wanted to add to what you were saying, Randy, because it was... I, perhaps this accounts for why people are interested in this period is that it was this last period before the internet and before social media took over. I was so interested that a study came out recently saying that we live in our phones and that they're like, we're like snails and that, that our iPhone is our shell. And I'm not bemoaning that this, but you know, but it has been a profound change. And I think as a result of that, people are kind of interested in what it was really like to exist in a small area and space and actually physically see people face to face. And I think that's what New York nightlife did then. So it's sort of great revolutionary ideas and the culture really gets shaped by what get, what went down in the nightclubs. Uh, and I think the legacy of that is so profound on our culture. You know, it's, it's impossible not to look at Instagram and all the selfies and, and not think about the club kids and their sort of shifting attention and focus on themselves. I mean, it was it, it feels very much an extension of those ideas. One of the things that, that really leapt out at me the more I watched it 
um, was the idea that, first of all, that everybody comes to New York to, to find their tribes and everybody feels like an outsider, but that every single person we talked to was mentored by someone else. And you have Diane talking about how Andy Warhol mentored her and Rudolph. And then you have uh, Michael Musto saying that the actress Sylvia Miles and the writer Cynthia Heimel uh, mentored him. He in turn mentored me. I in turn mentored Lisa E. Lisa E was mentored also by the photographer Patrick McMullen. Both Peter and Rudolph mentored Michael Alig, and Michael Alig mentored Walt Paper and Ernie Glam. And it just, and then you have Louis Extravaganza, who was mentored by Madonna and Jose Extravaganza, and everybody sort of comes into the scene and finds somebody who will help them and and get help them get their their sea legs, so to speak. And that to me has been one of the the fast. And we're sort of just getting started, so I think everybody ends up being. And you two certainly have mentored me as well, so I think everybody. It's just the circle of life, isn't it? Well, it is. I would just like to thank you, James, for inviting us along for the ride, because I think people are going to be so fascinated by your um, incredible forensic memory of, you know, the clubs in the 80s. I mean, like, truly, it's been a fascinating ride. Every single person has said... James, how do you have this memory when you were such a drug mess for so many years? And it's true that I might have been lying on the floor, but I was clocking every single thing that happened and filing it all away for just this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has led to this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My whole life has been a prelude to this show. <laughs> on the surface, it's about these big, loud, fabulous, you know, um, stars of the nightclub scene, but it's the conversations are intimate and you kind of get to know people a little bit more and get to see their vulnerabilities and what drives them. I came to New York because I wanted to meet everybody. I wanted to be, I read about these people. I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to um, just be around these fabulous, these these gorgeous, these these entertaining, these creative people. And um, I think I, that's that's another commonality that we all share. I mean, I think ultimately everybody was equally perhaps insecure and therefore it seemed that everybody was aloof when in fact they weren't. They were just shy and anxious and and you were the perfect icebreaker. And and genuinely, I thought I thought and I, I still think after all these years that you're lovely and warm and engaging and, and fun. Yeah, even when I, even when I turn off this camera. <laughs> <laughs> Another point that I want to very quickly make is we had talked um, it, just in private discussions, Randy and Fenton and I, about whether we should have some sort of uh, explanation for the different names that are dropped and there because you are being thrown a lot of different names in a lot of different places and clubs but then the idea that that it all should just sort of wash over you and just the idea that you're invited to this conversation to this party and we're grabbing you by the hand and just whisking you through and introducing you to a thousand different people all at once and it's just I think by the by the end of the first episode you will start to re realize who some of these people are and the names keep coming back again and you'll feel like they're, you're your friends google google yeah. google is your friend <laughs> google is your friend and i guess it's a bit like reading a gossip column right where there's bold faced names and you're reading it and you don't necessarily know who everyone is but exactly but That's they what... all sound fabulous <laughs> <laughs> yes i suppose the other thing also is i think we felt it was important to do night fever well a because we're extremely old with a collective age of several hundred years, but also because, you know, so many people from that time and that scene did not survive. You know, AIDS cut a swathe through the creative community. We are dedicating this first season to the legends of nightlife who we have lost. Oh my gosh, there's so many, right? People like, you know, Sylvia Miles and Anita Sarko, uh, Edvige, Stephen Sabin, um, uh, John Sex, Ethel Eichelberger, Wendy Wilde, Faye Runway, David Wojnarowicz, Andy Warhol. I, I mean, Robert Maplethorpe. 
it would be amazing to think if we were to do a, if we could do a series with all those who have passed on. Well, I wonder if season three is we just pick one a, per, a person like Anita Sarko and have other people come on and tell Anita Sarko stories and have everybody be a different person. I love that idea. That's a great idea. Although we've lost very many, that's why we felt it was so important to to do Night Fever before before we get disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can still remember and string a sentence together. I'm just here for the ride. With, with all that said and done, I'm very excited for you all to, to listen to and to watch uh, Night Fever, New York Nightlife Legends of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond, starting next week. Ah! Money, success.